Thank you, Amy. I'm very glad to be here with you, and thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, no, it's so great to connect. I know you have your upcoming one week long retreat in September, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but I thought it would be great for our viewers to hear a little bit about you, about the Center for Human Flourishing and, and how you got into this kind of work. Okay, that's um, maybe that's the hardest question for me to answer, but I have always been someone who has loved to help others become happier, better people, especially in, in what concerns their minds. You, you speak about happiness of being. It's something that I read a lot about uh, you and, and, and your programs. And I, I want to ask you, what is happiness of being and can everyone reach it? So this is the probably the most core question to CV, which CV is about emotional balance but it's not just emotional balance. Our main goal, our main aspiration is to cultivate this happiness of being and to use emotion as a, as a path for transformation and to support this aspiration. And so when we speak of happiness, I think we as a culture are used and trained to look for happiness outside. So in the external world. And no one can deny the importance of external things in our happiness, but this is to a certain point. This is to a point where our basic needs are met. And if we are lucky, we can even have a little of comfort. But we don't, we just don't stop there, do we? We don't stop there because even when that happens and most of us are lucky to be born into a world where that is mostly guaranteed, but we just don't stop there we feel something lacking, we feel a void, and we don't give it a second thought. We think that, oh, if there's something lacking, if I feel a void, then I must need more, more. I must need more of what's out there. I must need more money. I must need a better car, a new TV set, uh, a new game to play, more pleasure, more friends, more social recognition. And, this never stops because we are not really feeling that void. We think that it will feel, but it won't. And it just goes on and on. It, psychologists call it the hedonic treadmill. So you can run as fast as you want, you'll never leave the place. Mm -hmm. And we can see that it just go after the next thing, the next thing, and it never satisfies us. And we continue doing this, maybe destroying the environment around us, maybe hurting others that are in the way of what we want to without ourselves even getting happier. I think it highlights the need for, for us to cultivate a healthy mind, not just looking for external solutions um, to our problems as you know the magic pill, so to speak. Yes, yeah. every, we have such a, now there's a, a culture of distraction. So we have everything mm -hmm. to distract ourselves from our inner void, from television series and movies to games, to social media. We just yeah. cannot stay quiet for a while. We just cannot stay quiet for a while. Mm. So this, there, there are very interesting studies that compare the, 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 the salary, the medium salary of people across the years and their medium happiness. And the happiness is stable while the, the salary goes increasing, increasing, increasing. So, and on the other side, you see that rates of depression and anxiety are accelerating very, very much mm. so we can see that maybe if we stop for a while and think about it maybe happiness this this inner happiness comes from inside it's not mm. going to be found somewhere out there and mm. i think everybody knows that we can we don't need it's not about what comes from outside so we can be miserable as alan wallace one of the founders of cv likes to say we can be miserable all by ourselves without any help from outside. It's an inside job. So we can be sitting in a room with no stimuli at all, with nothing to do and be completely miserable. We can do that and it's an inside job. And I think not all, but many, some people also know that we can, we can also be sitting in a room with nothing to do, no, st no stimuli from outside and be profoundly happy, profoundly happy. So what's happening? 
it's this happiness that comes from our way of being. And this is the happiness of being. Aristotle called it the eudaimonia. Eudaimonia comes from the Greek eu, good, and daimon, which is spirit. So the happiness of having a good spirit. And when we try to investigate this happiness, we find that it is based on three primary things. And they are ethics, wisdom, and the mind that is yielding and pliant with a stable and vivid awareness and attention. And so ethics is the foundation of genuine happiness because happiness is just a feeling by itself. If it's not associated with value, it's just a feeling and it's never going to be fulfilling. Mm -hmm. But when it's associated with value, with ethics, with meaning, that's when happiness becomes genuine. And it no, it no longer comes from something that we get. It's from what we give, what we want and how we want how we are. And on the other side, we have, we have the happiness that comes from wisdom and insight. So this is the happiness that comes from deeply knowing ourselves and how the universe works and our relationship with them and everything. And what are the true causes of happiness and suffering? And this is of course something that Buddhism says a lot, but Christianity too. So there's a, a Christian saint, I believe, Thomas Aquinas, who speaks of truth given joy. So the, the joy from knowing the truth. And Jesus also said, uh, the truth shall set, you, shall set you free. So this is universal. You, you ask if everybody could, could reach this happiness of being, yes, it's universal. Mm. And at last we have that happiness that comes from our quality of awareness. And you can think in meditation, for example, in mindfulness of reading, for example, you are meditating on a completely neutral object, your breath. Mm. But when your mind is stable and quiet and vivid, it's just very enjoyable. It's very pleasant. And it's not the breath that suddenly becomes pleasant. It's the kind, it's the quality of your awareness. So an awareness free of afflictions, free of cravings and aversions. Mm. So these are the three pillars of this inner genuine happiness of being that we want to cultivate in CV. And how do we go about doing it? It's through mental balance. So mental mm. balance is the key to this, to this um, happiness of being. And then our goal is to understand what is the, the role of emotional balance in mental, in mental balance and how the two influence each other. Mm -hmm. So when you ask uh, if it's at the reach of, of everyone, I would change the word the reach because it makes us think mm -hmm. about conquering, about something that we're going to get from outside, and more that it's, it can be cultivated by everyone. So it's the difference from the hunter-gatherer mode where we go hunting after an animal to the, the farmer. So we are... Um, taking care of the of the land, tilling the land and planting the seeds to make the results grow. So that's the difference. And yes, everybody can cultivate it. And I I believe that it's actually the, the inner nature of everybody. And we just have to clean up all the mess that it that is over it. Wow. Yeah, no, what, really well said. I, I really like your alteration of that question. Can everyone cultivate happiness of being? Yes, I love that. And I think what you said about being in a box, so to speak, and either being miserable or being happy, you don't need any external influence. I think many of us experience this, whether the good and or the bad uh, or everything in between over this past year with the pandemic. And um, I think it really hopefully shed some light on what is happiness and hopefully people have been you know investigating that and cultivating ways of finding happiness that doesn't depend on some of these external factors as you mentioned yeah how do we make emotions work in our favor and how does your program help us help us find meaning with emotions and not just get distracted or or find them to be keeping us from happiness so emotions are everywhere in our lives. They, they make us think, do, speak a lot of what we do. And sometimes they do help us. 
and other times they don't they, and they can even hinder us they can hurt us or others or our goals and aspirations mm -hmm. and so what we ask here is how can we transform emotions in a way that they support our most beautiful and deepest aspiration and well-being as an individual and as a community and that's what we ask. And then we want to do to actually do it. So to actually do it, we have to begin to explore and understand emotions and what causes them. So what makes emotions arise? And that's what we do in CV. We, we go to investigate deep what makes emotions arise and what makes them either constructive or destructive. So that's also a very, a very important distinction that we make. We don't classify emotions, whether they are uh, positive or negative or pleasant mm -hmm. or unpleasant, because we believe that every emotion has a role, has a function, and even, even anger can have an important role, an important function. But the problem is when they don't do it well, so they are dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And so we classify them not as pleasant or unpleasant, good or bad, we classify them as constructive or destructive, or wholesome and unwholesome, according to whether they support our genuine well-being or not. Mm -hmm. And so we go to look into the causes of the emotions in order to transform them, what's behind mm -hmm. the emotional balance. Mm -hmm. And another great important thing, greatly important thing, is that the problem of emotions is that often they don't give us a choice. So when we are in the grip of an emotion, we, have, we are in that which Paul Ekman and other psychologists call uh, the refractory period. It's a period during which our mind cannot access information that would otherwise be easily accessible. So it's a selective filtering of information. We are only able to access the information that supports the emotion. For example, if we, we, if we are feeling hate towards somebody, we, can, we cannot see their good qualities and we can only see their bad qualities and we even exaggerate them, we make them bigger. So that's part of the refractory period. And it's also, its characteristic is also compulsive. So it, it tends to lead us to compulsive behaviors. It, like it doesn't give us a choice. It's very hard to resist an emotion and a strong emotion. We feel compelled to take a behavior which can often be destructive to us, to others, to the environment. And so we want to learn how we can get, how we can gain and construct choice in our emotional experience, how we can be able to decide if we want to engage with emotion and if yes, how. And mm. the first step towards emotional regulation is to become more aware of our emotional experience. So it's emotional awareness is at the core of CV. We, we plan to build and develop this emotional awareness that will allow us to recognize when we are in the grip of an emotion and then maybe be able to transform it into a constructive one. Mm, there's certainly times where uh, being gripped by emotion. And I was just thinking when you were saying, you know, I don't know that I'm when I'm in it, that I'm thinking about whether this is wholesome or 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 a helpful emotion or a destructive emotion, we're just gripped by it. But I think what you said about being aware of that is, is the first step. And so, so how do people become aware of their emotions? What, what are some of the tools that, that you teach and that you lead people through? So one of the most powerful ways of becoming aware of our emotions is becoming aware of its effects in the body. So mm. our emotions are greatly embodied. They are felt in the body. So if we can begin to familiarize ourselves with the feeling of emotion in the body, we can begin to very more, much more easily recognize when we are beginning to feel an emotion. And it's much easier to, to stop and leave the refractory period when the emotion is beginning than when it's already raging when it's already very strong. So it's what we say that uh, recognizing the spark before the flame, that's the, mm -hmm. the idea. So this is one of the most uh, powerful ways. It's recognizing the emotion in the body, but there are many other ways, including recognize, recognizing <laughs> mental patterns, recognizing triggers and working with triggers. And of course, mindfulness is a practice that supports us greatly because mindfulness allows us to, to 
strengthen and improve our awareness, our present moment awareness and all kinds of awareness. Mm -hmm. So if we are more able to, during our daily lives, to be more present, more aware of what's going on, both in our minds and in our bodies, then we'll be much more able to recognize the beginning of emotions and transform them. Mm, I love that. Recognize the spark before the flame. That's a great uh, quote. Um, I know that at least for me, I feel like a, like a really strong sensation in the heart area. And I imagine for everyone, it's different, but just being familiar with what those feelings are and understanding how to sit with them and not react and to stay exactly. autonomous. Yeah. Interesting that every person has their own distinct, distinct feeling of emotion, mm -hmm. but they all also have similarities between the same emotions. So anger can make ev almost everybody feels warm in the face, uh, maybe mm -hmm. in the chest, uh, the chest tight, the hands uh, also warm and contracting. So they also have emotions have at the same time a, a great individuality and also a great uh, universality. Mm. And I imagine your, your medical uh, training has helped you to bring the understanding of the actual biochemical reactions in the body that accompany those emotions. Has, has that given you an expanded vocabulary to access more people or, or how has that education, I guess, helped you the most? Yes, for sure that uh, the medical training helps bring a, a new light into these things mm -hmm. and see them from this perspective and have a better vocabulary. And I love to make comparisons when I'm teaching with the mm -hmm. medical part, the physiology and anatomy. I think that's uh, very interesting comparisons. And um, yeah. So you also are about to finish being a doctor as well. Yes, if everything goes well in June, I'll be a doctor, I'll finish my course. And it's actually interesting that my whole life until, until then, I have always said that I was never going to choose medicine, never. Of course, I didn't understand what, what it was, but I say that. But then I chose it because it seemed to be a path towards what I wanted. So it was the, the only path that I knew. I didn't knew others. So I chose that one. And I actually really love to learn about the body and all of that. And I think it gives me a very sound base, a very sound ground, and uh, to explore also from the contemplative side and to bring the two together, I think it's um, a beautiful endeavor. Mm, no, that is, that is really special, especially with so much division between Western medicine and Eastern thought. It's so um, special to be bringing them together and to have the specializations in both, in both fields. It's very interesting to study psychology and meaning and all of that from an external physical perspective, from behavior or neurons. But I was not so much interested in the neurons, neurons themselves, but what's actually happening in the mind. So I, I was more interested in the contemplative side of uh, mental science. Mm. Well, so for the, for the lucky people that get to join you in person in your retreat here in the Azores in September, what's in store for them? So CV is a, uh, uh, is a program um, that was developed by from um, a meeting between the Dalai Lama and behavioral scientists. And it was actually the Dalai Lama that requested uh, uh, a program to help people cultivate a better emotional balance that supported mm. them in their genuine inner happiness and well-being. Mm. So that's a program that joins the two sides. It joins the Western scientific perspective with the contemplative Buddhist perspective in a, in a cooperation to bring emotional and mental well-being to everybody. It, it is a really um, a cooperation between the best research in emotional and psychology from Western science and the, the most useful and, and important practices and, and wisdom of contemplative, of contemplative practices based on Buddhism and here, Buddhism is not seen as religion, but as a mind science, so a science of mind. And this course is completely open to anyone from any religion or no religion is completely secular. Mm. 
Well, that's amazing. I'm, I'm so grateful that you found us and that you're hosting this program here at Minu Vida. It's, um, it just sounds like you're, you're really bringing such peace and happiness and well-being to all the people that you'll touch in this retreat. And uh, I'm just, I'm so grateful that we connected. <laughs> Me too. Your place yeah. is very beautiful. And that's also in store for participants. So a very beautiful <laughs> and cozy retreat center or farm or what, uh, yeah. with, uh, what I find, what I think to be delicious food and around uh, an amazing environment and landscape to explore, which I think is very supporting of the spirit that we want to cultivate in CV, which is yeah. this Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, the energy here of, of just being present, you know, it really supports any kind of exploration of being present. And yeah, the food, I can't wait for you to try it. <laughs> well, I am so um, grateful for your time today, Philippe. Thank you so much. And we'll include links to your retreat in this uh, post. But again, please follow Philippe and his incredible work, the Center for Human Flourishing. You can find him on Instagram and Facebook, as well as his website. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.